Hello, everyone. Um, I, I'm going to describe today uh, C3. Uh, C3 is an internet scale control plane for video quality optimization. Uh, C3 has been in operation and in active use by many content providers for several years. Um, and uh, it represents a, a singular proof point for uh, centralized control at internet scale. Um, and we believe the ideas presented here are, are more broadly applicable also to other applications, um, including maybe gaming and video conferencing, as well as network layer control. So to, to start, it's, it's now abundantly clear that television uh, you know, in mass is moving to the internet. Um, in, along with that, uh, a huge amount of video traffic is, is also coming to the internet. Um, in fact, today, video traffic already dominates the internet. And given the rate at which this traffic is increasing um, and the business drivers that are driving this traffic, for example, paid subscription services like the ones here on the left, uh, the expectations on video quality are rapidly approaching that of traditional television networks. Uh, viewers experience the same, expect the same HD experience that they've been always used to. Uh, they expect to see you know, instant start and a smooth, uninterrupted playback through the whole experience. Now, to achieve this on the internet, we need to have a, uh, we need to be able to optimize the quality for every single session, and we need to be able to do that continuously throughout the lifetime of that session. Now, when we say optimization, the, the first kind of a natural question is where do we want to optimize the experience? And in particular, what specific actuation mechanisms do we want to take advantage of, of in doing this optimization? And, and, and as we know, there, there are many layers and many places we could choose to optimize. Uh, we could choose to do it at the CDN layer, at the server infrastructure. We could choose to do it in the network. Or we could choose to do it in the client, in the end application. And all are valid approaches, and um, all uh, will, will have benefit. Um, we chose to focus more on the, on the actuations in the client because it is more favorable to incremental deployment in the industry. And now, not to say that um, the others are, are, are not good for future work. In, in fact, they're actually very valid extensions of what we're doing here. Now, the challenge in optimizing at the client is that there are many choices that we have in the optimization space. And because of the very nature of what we are optimizing, the decision has to be made very quickly. Uh, more specifically, the, the optimization parameters we have are, are, can be numerous, but two very specific ones that, that are, are, are popularly done are the bitrate that you use to stream the video and the CDN, or the delivery resource you can use to, to stream it from. Um, bit rates can be anywhere from 8 to 10 and, and even more bit rates now given that industries continues to push the, the limit on bit rates. Or this, and the CDN can be a small handful or if we go to finer granularity resources, it all can also be a very large number. Now, one thing is the performance of these resources continue to change over time and this has been shown many times in previous work. And because of this, the optimization that we're talking about is not a static optimization. It must actually be done throughout the lifetime of the session. Um, so the existing approaches to solve this problem are, are primarily reactive, and they use uh, a probe and update method, meaning you, you try a bitrate, you see how it works, and then based on that you decide maybe you switch up, switch down, or you probe multiple different resources and pick the one with the highest throughput. But these generally it will take a long time because of the number of different options that you have to choose from, number of different options in that space to search. So now the question is what if we could predict the outcome, predict the optimal choice? What if we could actually predict the outcome of every one of these options and then based on that prediction select the best one and then continue to adapt that as the prediction changes over time? Now to build a system like this uh, we would have to be able to collect quality information from every single client into a central location so that we have a global view. We'd have to build a prediction model based on that data to, to be able to predict the outcome for each individual client and then make those predictions and drive decisions based on that and feed those decisions back to every client all in real time. Now, of course, there are numerous challenges to actually building a system like this. Um, we'd have to from the actual design, the architecture of this, the scaling of this for, for true internet scale control, 
and even the, the prediction model itself and how to make these decisions. Um, in this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on the architecture of building a system like this, a centralized control system for making these types of decisions and not so much on the actual algorithms or the prediction model. Now, to, to start with kind of the main challenges, uh, the first one we run into um, is at the client layer itself, even before we can even collect the quality information. The, we've, we've seen a, a significant heterogeneity in the actual device platforms that exist uh, where consumers can watch video. I think this is pretty clear to all of us. Uh, we've seen over 100 unique software platforms that can be used to deliver video. And this is not including the actual hardware devices. This is purely software environments to play video across all the different devices out there. Now, the kind of the straw man, the default solution would be, well, let's implement a, a client software you know, and port it 100 times. And that could be done. It would be a fairly large porting exercise, but it could be done. Um, but the challenge, the issue is this, even with this, it, it won't work. And there are two reasons why. One is that not only are the environments themselves heterogeneous, meaning the operating system or the programming language used are different, but the actual interface to collect quality information from clients are all different, which poses a significant challenge to actually having a consistent view of quality across all of these different clients out there. The second major challenge is that the software update cycle on all these devices can be very slow. We're, we're, no, longer, we're no longer in the world of, of web where you can update a JavaScript or a Flash object and it'll just refresh every time someone loads the page. We're in the world of app downloads, where in the mobile world it can be you know, a month or two between updates. In the smart TV world it could be many months. In the set-top box world it can be more than a year. So this significantly hinders the evolution capability of this type of platform and, and can easily drive such a system to a halt if you can't change the client. So based on this, the kind of the design approach that, that we're taking is to build a very thin or very minimal client layer. And in doing this, we move as much of the computation out of the client as possible. All the computation, all the logic, as much of the things that would evolve out of the client. And build, define a very small, narrow waist kind of interface to both collect abstracted events as well as send those events to the controller so that all of the logic and anything that would change would be in the controller. And I'll go in more into this um, a little bit later in the talk. And the second major challenge is building, is making real-time predictions at internet scale and bu building a system that can do that. Now I want to qualify a little bit what I mean by internet scale. First is geographic scale. So we have to support a true worldwide geographic deployment as video services can be truly worldwide, every country, every continent on the planet. Second is network scale. We have to, these, the viewers can be on any type of network, a cellular network, cable network, and we have to be able to support all the different deployments of such network. And the third and obvious one is client scale. And as more and more video traffic comes to the internet, we're talking about tens to hundreds of millions of concurrent clients that are all going to be streaming at the same time. Now, achieving a, a real-time response based on a global view, a real-time global view of network-wide information at internet scale is not really feasible based on technology that exists today. To understand that better, let's look at a couple of straw man options. First, we could build a, glo a, central global a centralized global controller which has all of the data collected into it and then you run through, take some of the latest big data technologies, try to build, process that data, and build a model in real time. And this, the best you could do is probably in the order of tens of seconds, minutes, in, if you really optimize this. Um, but that's still not real time. That's not fast enough to give responses to clients. The, the second approach would be partition. So you partition the controller into many different uh, you know, smaller uh, you know, it's partition the viewers into many different smaller groups and assign a controller to each one. But given the scale at what we're talking about, each of these will have many partitions and each will be fairly small, which means that nothing will actually has a global view. And so you cannot make the kind of predictions we're talking about. So to tackle this problem, uh, what we decided to do is split the control plane in two layers. First layer is a global prediction layer. It is based on all of the data, it creates a prediction model. Um, and this is running in near real time and using an optimized big data stack that can run in the order of a minute or two, can update that model in a minute or two. 
And then the second layer is a decision layer, which is making real-time decisions, sub-second timescale decisions for every single client using that global model, as well as the up-to-date up information from the client. And with this, we can achieve a true real-time response using a global model of internet scale. Now, putting all of the pieces I've talked about together into one picture, we have a, a client layer, a, a specifically a sensing and actuation layer in the C3 platform, which has built into it a, a kind of a narrow waste device API, and we call this the Conviva Streamer Proxy. Um, and this has an interface that has, that has a, it's an abstract interface for collecting quality measurements from devices. And it's integrated with, <coughs> sorry, it's integrated with devi different devices using adapters for, for, to, to translate from the device interface to this common interface. This Conviva Streamer Proxy uses a, a, a narrow waste protocol called a session data model, which allows us to transit, tra tra allows us to send uh, events and states about the actions happening within the player uh, to the controller. And then in the controller we have two layers, a modeling layer that's making near real time, uh, that's creating the model in near real time, and then a decision layer that's making real time decisions, feeding that back to the controller. Now I'll talk about a couple of these in more detail, um, starting with the, the data model itself, the protocol where, that we use to transfer this information to the controller. So now I'll use a motivating example to kind of showcase the, the design choice that we made here. And the, the example I'll use is in computing a very simple metric called the video startup time. This metric is, shows the time from when a user would press the play button to the time the video actually shows on the screen. And so it's a very critical metric for video. Now, the default option would be the, for the client to compute this metric based on how long it took and then send an event saying this is, you know, video startup time was X. And we could easily compute it based on these events when from the west, when the session started to when the play started, we compute the difference and send that event. Now, let's take the example where a, pub, a, a content provider later added pre-roll ads, which is also very common. I think we've all seen it. Um, and now here, you may not want to include the pre-roll ad as part of the video startup time because that would tend to dominate the whole startup time, masking real issues. So now the video startup time metric might be computed as this. So it's the overall time and where you subtract out the time of the ad playback itself. Now, the question now is how do we adapt to changes like this? If this computation was done in the client, it, would be, it could take a very long time to actually roll out that change to all the different devices, all the implementations, and actually get it out into the different devices. So, to solve this problem, what we do is we actually expose those low-level events that I showed in the previous slide, and not the actual com com the metric, the end result metric. And, and to do this, we defined a, the session data model. And the session data model essentially allows us to expose those events and do the computation in that previous example, the video startup time, in the controller. Uh, the SDM has three aspects to it, events, states and measurements. Events are one-time actions. For example, um, this uh, network error. So it's an error could have occurred and that will be an event that goes to the controller. Or it could indicate a state transition, for example, from playing to buffering. That will be an event. Um, then we have states. States are persistent variables that can change over time. And uh, for example, the player state is one which, is, which here is showing joining, playing, rebuffering, um, you know, could be paused. Those, that's a state. And, and the, the reason for states is that it, it gives us a good robustness property to event loss. So if, you had, if we had lost the event that indicated a transition from playing to buffering, the controller would no longer know that it's actually buffering now. However, with the states, we can immediately recover that, that information. And then the third piece is measurements, which is continuous numerical values, such as download rate or rendering rate. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the C3 controller and the, the two layers of, of computation inside that are using this SDM information coming in. Uh, the, the split control plane is characterized by this dual loop control system. The, the first and kind of fine-grained loop um, is represented here by the red arrows. So we have a client which is sending this SDM information periodically in what we call as heartbeats. They're essentially periodic messages that embed, encode those events from the past period. In the controller, in the decision layer part of the controller, we, make, we compute the metrics such as the video startup time or buffering time. 
and then make per client decisions and feed those decisions back to the, to the client. And this is in a sub-second, very fast control loop. The second control loop is where we actually build a global model. Here, the SDM information is aggregated in the modeling layer, so it's coming from all the decision layer instances into the, into the modeling layer. We aggregate this performance across all clients, and then train a prediction model. And then that prediction model is disseminated back to the decision layer components. From then on, the decision layer components would use the global model as well as local real-time information about the individual client that it's trying to optimize and then make decisions. Now, one thing to note is that the decision layer here, which is really the piece that helps to scale out this, this architecture into a truly internet scale system and can have real-time response, is, uh, is an intelligent layer. It is, it's, it's uh, as opposed to a caching layer, which may be caching and replicating content, there's actually running intelligent logic that's making decisions. Now, a natural question to ask here is, can this split layer uh, control work? And the, the question here is, can we truly relax the modeling layer to be a few minutes behind real time and relax that freshness and, and, and will it work? And here we use a domain-specific insight that the globally optimal decision tends to be persistent in the order of minutes. And we did an experiment looking at real data to look at the persistence of these decisions over time. And we found that more than 80% of the time, the persistence is more than three minutes. And, that's, that's, and, we, and this has been consistent across three different content providers. This means that we can get a near optimal performance with a three minute delay in the global model. But it's important to note that this only holds for the aggregate global model. It does not hold for individual client information. Hence why the decision layer has to use per client, the most up-to-date per client information in making that decision. Uh, now, given all this, there are a few systems level challenges we need to solve. The first is, uh, is about performance, and performance here is about responsiveness and scale. Uh, to achieve sub-second response time, we distribute the decision layer into many uh, distributed front-end data centers, and we also use cloud uh, environments to get this quickly deployed into many regions. To achieve uh, the scale of the controller, we horizontally scale out the decision layer into in many entities and use a property that the decision layer entities are independent of each other. They only depend on the global model. They don't actually communicate with each other. So it's very easy to horizontally scale this. And we use cloud environments for burst scale capability. And then for the controller itself, we use a multiple big data technologies, um, including Spark, to actually optimize to achieve minute level model creation. And then for fault tolerance, uh, the decision layer gracefully degrades, and, and the, the architecture actually allows a fairly simple fault tolerance here because the decision layer gracefully degrades when it does not get an updated model. There's a very loose coupling between these two layers, meaning if the model doesn't come, it can use the previous model, and if there's no model, it can fall back to making decisions without the model. And then there's, if a decision layer entity itself fails, there is a natural failover in the client, given that many devices that play video have a local adaptive logic for playing video. It actually fails back to that. And when a client is mapped back to a decision layer entity, the SDM has the built-in property of the state, which allows the decision layer entity to quickly reconstruct the state of the client and then take over making decisions. Now, um, as I said before, the C3 platform has been deployed in production and in, in production environments for about eight years. Um, we've, this, what I just presented is the results of multiple evolutions, actually three phases of evolution of the architecture. This is the third phase. There were two earlier phases which, where we tried different architectures for scaling. The first architecture actually used a more traditional partitioning approach. And as the scale of video started to grow, that approach started to fall apart and we lost the global view very quickly. Then we used a more heavy client approach where we were able to offload a lot of the execution of logic to the client and be able to update that logic very quickly. This approach started to fall apart about four years ago when device heterogeneity really started to hit everyone. And hence we came to the architecture that we have now. Uh, the C3 platform has, is being used by many content providers, many of the premium providers that we may be using today. Um, we see over a billion unique devices of traffic uh, at any point in time, and in, in concurrency scale, we've seen some of the largest live events on this, on this platform, and we've seen over three million concurrent viewers 
on events such as a World Cup or a Super Bowl. Um, and um, the, the most important result was that we've seen significant quality improvement, which is, of course was a goal of all of this. And I'll quickly go through uh, a couple of results. There's several systems over results in the paper, but I'm going to talk about the quality improvement results here. Uh, this is a, a, a graph representing the buffering ratio. Buffering ratio is the percent of time that a video is frozen on a screen. And this is data from uh, a one-month A-B test where we're using a native controller, which is a local adaptive bitrate controller in the device, and the C3 controller. And we see more than 50% reduction in the buffering ratio. Similarly, we'll look at uh, video start failures, which is the percent of time that a video fails to start playing. It's probably the most catastrophic failure you could experience. And we see a significant reduction here also, over 60%. And then we looked at multiple different content providers to make sure this is not something specific to one provider. And we saw a similar pattern of improvement across uh, multiple providers. Now, Based on all of, all of this all the ex experience, I want to draw on a f just a few lessons to, to highlight. One is the, the C3 platform validates the centralized control approach at an unprecedented scale. We were able to achieve a real-time performance at an internet scale of millions of concurrent clients. In addition, it reinforces the case for centralized control. And we've seen multiple new drivers and enablers for this. So in terms of drivers, we talked about client heterogeneity already. But we've seen other ones. Global policies is another very critical driver. And here is a business policy that, uh, that a provider may have that constrains the use of different resources based on contractual obligations. And that fits straight into how you pick resources for optimization. And then second, this platform has enabled an unparalleled new real-time operational monitoring use case that many content providers use today, which would not be possible with this kind of, without this kind of centralization. In addition, we've seen unique challenges here specific to this domain and new ideas that have come out of these challenges. First is the split level control that allows us to have a, both a global view and real time performance. Second is the minimal client architecture which has been critical to handle device heterogeneity. And, and we believe these ideas have broader applicability both to other applications, maybe other uh, internet scale applications like gaming or video conferencing or voice, as well as network layer control uh, in, the, in the SDN or CDNs. And then finally to conclude, um, we all know, you know television is coming to the internet and this is bringing very high expectations on quality. The, the large optimization space that exists for video quality um, is really driving a more proactive approach than what's being used in the industry so far with reactive adaptive algorithms. C3 is a centralized predictive control approach to build a proactive system for this. And it solves two key challenges, device heterogeneity and achieving an internet scale. And it's been used by multiple content providers already with significant quality improvements. So um, to first thank everyone for listening. And uh, before I go to questions, I need to say we have, uh, Conviva is, is continues to build this platform and we have a tremendous amount of work to do. So we are definitely looking for people to join us. Um, and then now I'll take questions. Thank you. Hi, great work. Uh, this is Aaron Lee from Bell Labs. Uh, one quick question. So do you do uh, specific uh, optimization um, for L device that access the, uh, uh, the networks through LTE networks? We don't, so we do, our, our algorithms are aware of where a specific, a, a specific devices, what type of network or what type of uh, geography or type of device they're on. And there are certain things that, that we do. Um, uh, but it is, uh, the, the, the goal is to try to have, the goal is of centralization is so that we can actually adapt our logic to different types of networks. So there are a few things that we do. Um, yeah, because your model is based on three minutes, uh, so uh, prediction, right? So according to our experience, uh, three minutes, you'll lose a lot of the opportunities in terms of the access bandwidth opportunities. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, what, uh, what the, the data that we, saw, that we saw showed that we have at aggregate, we see that there's enough persistence to use that delay, have that kind of delay in the freshness to, to make the decisions. Now, ideally, we would like to push that to much smaller, to like that, 
the global prediction model to be even much less than three minutes, down to a few seconds. Um, and that's, that is the direction we want to go. It's really more driven by what's possible by the big data technologies out there. But you know, that's an example where it would be great to push that to even smaller numbers. Thanks. Cool. Let me ask you a question. So you mentioned that the partitioned approach didn't work out very well. Can you share your experience on that? Wh why and what happened there? Sure. Yeah, in, in the partition approach, the main challenge is we end up with having a, a large number of partitions. And when you have that, we lose the global view of the, the, the broader internet, uh, the broader client uh, base out there. So uh, each partition may be able to handle a few thousand sessions. So you end up having thousands of partitions, meaning that you, you start to lose the global view, you start to lose the ability to optimize with that level of data. Let's thank Aditya.